Well, this has been a rough week in the Van Zandt family. I know some of you saw my posting on Facebook and our dog died this week. And, you know, it's just, just, it, it just what a good friend dude was, you know. And going on, I'll know the preacher's going to talk about his personal problems. And I, uh, I, the reason I bring this up is because through this whole thing, and you might want to cover your ears, I, I don't know, it, it's... Uh, I'm not sure that dogs go to heaven. I'm just not sure. I'm not, you know. I want to believe that. I want to, and like I said, you might might want to cover your ears if you if you don't uh, if you don't want to hear this. But as as we were going through this process with 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 dude, and he was, we were putting him down. Um, there's a sense with me that. You know, it's the end of a chapter. I'm not sure there's another one. It's simply because I have no biblical information that gives me that. I have no concrete word from God that says this. That way. Now, I want it to be that way. And, and you know, I, we can work it all out in our head and, and say, yeah, it's got to be that way because God wouldn't do anything other than that, right? But I don't know. I, I really, you know, everybody's going... Oh, the preacher says my dog is lost. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, when it comes to evidence, I don't have that evidence. And I was, uh, as I was driving home in the car on Wednesday from um, having put him down, and, um, you know, I was an emotional mess. He was my good friend for so many years. And you know, what struck me was that the way I was feeling right then is the way that millions of people feel as they're driving home from the hospital and they don't know the Lord. And they don't know. They don't have that assurance. They just felt hopeless. It's like, you know, I don't... It's like the way I felt that day was the way that a lot of people feel all the time. I don't, you know, I used to be like that myself. But just... To not trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that's, that's where you are, you know? Okay, now I want to warn you, this, this, uh, this sermon is rated PG-13, okay? All the children are gone out of the room. If you believe in Santa Claus, the Easter, fairy, uh, the Easter bunny, or the, fa- the tooth fairy, I'll get it out. Uh, you probably should leave, okay, because <laughs> there, goes, there goes the congregation right there. All right. I, I, you know, I, I want to believe in Santa Claus, and I'm sure he believes in me, right? But what I'm saying is that I'm just going to talk real frank this morning, and I don't know any other way to do this. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to spin it for you, leave stuff out, because what we've got in this chapter you know, in, in the Bible today is, is just some blunt stuff, and, and some people don't like to read this. Um, what we have today in 1 Corinthians 15 is quite different uh, story from what we see in the movies and what we see in some other things about what happens after you die. And, and we are so far away from the truth of the Bible and our general understanding in America about heaven and the afterlife. We are so far away from this that this sounds mean. I mean, that's, you know, it's like me saying, I'm not sure my dog went to heaven. People go, he's just mean. He's just being mean. And and this kind of sounds that way, you know, because it just looks wrong and somewhat cruel. And at first glance, you know, what's been constructed by our secular world and also aided by the silence of the church, me included on on Sundays when I didn't put that PG-13 up there, you know, seems more digestible. It really does. And I want to talk a little bit about the myth. Uh, Maria Shriver, who is one of the Kennedys, she used to be married to Arnold, what's his name, you know. But uh, she wrote a children's book that's entitled, What's Heaven? And uh, I came across this, and she just does a great job of giving what the 21st century impression is about what happens in the future. This is what she said. Heaven is somewhere you believe in. It's a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk to other people who are there. At night, you can sit next to the stars, which are the brightest of anywhere in the universe. If you're good throughout your life, then you can go 
then you get to go to heaven. When your life is finished here on earth, God sends angels down to take you up to heaven to be with him. And grandma is alive in me. Most important, she taught me to believe in myself. She's in a safe place with the stars, with God and the angels. She is watching over us from up there. That's Maria Shriver in a book for children about heaven. Now, is that accurate? Is that from God? I mean, is that adequate? Is that adequate for us to build a life on? Of sitting on clouds next to stars? I mean... Did God send his son to be crucified so we could have this picture that, that eternity is going to be, you know, dangling my feet over the cloud, watching people down below? Is, is that why Jesus died? So we would have that story? The mythology that has evolved in America come from the teachings of a Greek philosopher, Plato. Uh, Plato taught that the human body was a prison that restrained people, and that death freed us from that prison. So death was a very good thing. He said that after death we are free from the body, and that's the benefit of death. No, no doubt there was a lot of suicide in the ancient Greek world too, as people were getting free of that body. For Plato, the physical world is a limitation on our knowledge, and not something which makes life more full and complete. So to lose the physical world is to be set free. The next life is a fuller life than this one, not less than it because we have no bodies. Now, you know, Corinth was just a few miles from Athens where Plato had lived. And the Greek philosophers ruled there. And, you know, our context of our scripture today, this, this teaching is definitely in the church at Corinth because... Paul, like Jesus, taught the resurrection of the body. Okay, not, the, not being free from the body, but the resurrection of the body. And the body was not evil. The body was not beyond redemption. The body was created by God. And remember, God said that it's good. It's very good when he made the human body. But we've been influenced so much by this Greek myth that we don't hear that today. And not even in Christianity. We just skip right over that. Belief in the resurrection and teaching of the resurrection runs through the New Testament. From Jesus to the apostles to the early church leaders. There's no teaching in Christianity up until the 20th century that gives us anything other than the resurrection of the body. This is all kind of new to us. Okay? Now this is a long chapter. We're not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to read it all uh, later today. The first uh, opening verses, Paul states what the gospel is. Uh, he says that Christ died for our sins, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, and then he appeared to the apostles, and he appeared to hundreds of people. And Paul says, here is where we stand on this. That's the way he begins his chapter. Here is where we stand is on this evidence, this gospel. But then he addresses the problem there at Corinth with some people who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they don't believe in the resurrection of all people. So we're going to start reading here 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. He says, So if the message that is preached says that Christ has been raised from the dead, then how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. We are found to be false witnesses about God because we testified against God that he raised Christ when he didn't raise him. If that's the case, then the dead aren't raised. If the dead aren't raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And what's more, those who have died in Christ are gone forever. If I have a hope in Christ only in this life, then we deserve to be pitied more than anyone else. Paul says that the word has come to him that some are teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead. There is no resurrection of Christ then, he says. And if that's their stance, then their faith is useless. 
He says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then the resurrection of Christ didn't happen. Those two are dependent on each other. We don't normally think of that. We'll say, well, yeah, Jesus Christ was resurrected, but when I die forever, I'm just going to heaven. I'm going to get free of this body. And he says, no, the two are tied together. There's no resurrection of believers without the resurrection of Christ. And the resurrection of Christ only makes sense if he was the first one of the resurrection of everybody. Christ has not been resurrected, he says, then our face in vain. We are without hope. All is lost. We need to make some stories up about clouds and stars and little puppy dogs. We need something to stand on. Christian faith does not rest on a story of how we want things to be. Christian faith rests on a fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Faith stands in the resurrection. And if that didn't happen, Paul says, we're all lost. We're still in our sin. It's all just a made-up myth, he says. We're just basing our lives on a nice story. Did you realize that? Did you realize that the resurrection of Jesus and believers, that they are that important? Most of us focus on the cross. The resurrection is the linchpin. The resurrection is the foundation upon which we stand. And if it didn't happen, nothing else makes any sense for us. It says that over and over in Scripture. Faith and hope depend on the resurrection. That's why Paul began detailing exactly what he had witnessed on the resurrection. He said in verse 6, he says, Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time, most of whom are still alive when he wrote that letter in the year 56. It's been 20 years then since the resurrection. 500 people saw Jesus at one time together, and Paul says most of them are still alive. In other words, if you don't believe me, go find some of them because they'll tell you exactly that they saw him alive. Almost 500 people in one group. Paul says there's the witnesses. It's a fact. It isn't a Greek myth. Okay. Jesus is alive. He had a new body. And Paul says, if that didn't happen, then you have no faith and there's no hope. We are not the gathering Christian church. We're just the gathering social club. That's what we are. Because you see everything else that we do, then if there's no resurrection, it's meaningless. It has no significance whatsoever. We're, we're just a group of people that just gather together, he says. You know, there's a growing hopelessness in our world. I'm, I'm sure that you sense that as well as I do. As our culture draws further and further away from a central belief in Jesus Christ, our world is becoming more and more hopeless. Um, there's so many people, they, they have no hope of marriage. They, they've never seen a good marriage. They have no hope of, of, a, of a good job. You know, that's evaporating away from them. Education scores are on a downward spiral. Really cheering you up today, aren't I? Uh, don't trust in government. Bunch of crooks in government. Don't trust your neighbors. Just hopelessness is, is growing in, in our world. And it's not just young people. Uh, back in May, New York Times ran an article on this and said suicide rates among middle-aged Americans, middle-aged Americans have risen sharply in the past decade. And here are the stats. From 1999 to 2010, 11 years, the suicide rate among Americans aged 35 to 64 rose nearly 30%. Thirty percent up in eleven years. Most Americans, more Americans, excuse me, die of suicide than die of car accidents. Three thousand more a year take their own lives than die. Now, some of that's true because our cars are much safer than what they used to be. But the but suicide is just rampant today. The most pronounced increases were seen among men in their fifties. A group in which suicides jumped nearly fifty percent. The suicide rate for middle-aged men was three times higher than for middle-aged women. Researchers claim that the reason for suicide are often complex, but the article had two factors. It says uh, the stress of economic downturn and the availability of prescription painkillers played into the rise in suicide rates. But it's also hinted that the deeper issues like failed expectations, loss of hope, might be a root cause of increased suicides. 
talking about the boomers, my generation, says the boomers had great expectations for what their life would look like, but it hasn't turned out that way. Uh, the doctor warns that the future generations will be facing the same conditions that lead to a sense of despair. Isn't that a bummer? Wow. Again, well, let me cheer you up a little bit. Uh, here's, here's another study, all right? Um, Rush University Medical Center Chicago um, said that belief in a concerned God can actually make medications work better. Okay, a little bit of hope in your life, belief in a God that's concerned for you. And the operative belief here is caring. Researchers said the study found that those with strong beliefs in a personal concerned God were more likely to experience improvement. The researchers compared the levels of melancholy or hopelessness in 136 adults diagnosed with major depression or bipolar depression with their sense of religious well-being. What they found was the top sector of those people with faith, the top third, that they had a 75% greater chance of recovery. That the medications just seemed to work better, tied specifically to the belief that a supreme being cared. So a little bit of hope goes a long ways, doesn't it? Resurrection gives us hope, you know. We stand on that resurrection. God is in charge, and what we do here today is part of building his kingdom. We may not see the little piece that we put in today, but it is. It's all building a kingdom that has no end. Now, Paul goes on here. He concludes to explain how and when the resurrection of believers will take place. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning now, we jump to the 20th verse. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first crop of the harvest of those who have died. Since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead come through one too. In the same way that everyone dies in Adam, so also everyone will be given life in Christ. Jesus Christ is the first to be resurrected. He says he's the first crop. Your translation might say first fruits, you know, the, the first offering of the year. And then down to verse 23, it says, Each event will happen in the right order. Christ, the first crop of the harvest, then those who belong to Christ at his coming, and then the end when Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he brings every form of rule, every authority, and power to an end, it's necessary for him to rule until he puts all enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be brought to an end. A time will come when this age is complete. It will happen. We say, well, when? Well, we're 2,000 years closer to it than we were when Paul first wrote that. We know that. We don't know when it is, but it's closer than when he thought it was. When that day comes, there's going to be an end to disease. There's going to be an end to hate. There's going to be an end to sin. There's going to be an end to greed. There's going to be an end to tears and sorrow. And finally, there's going to be an end to death. Death is the last enemy, he says. It's not going to happen anymore. You're going to have a body that lives forever, a body that lives forever, not a spirit just purely ghost-like spiritual existence. Paul goes on to give more teaching about the nature and the necessity of the, risen, of the resurrected body. And he goes through 25 verses of talking about this. And then he tells uh, that day that it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I jump some more. He says, This is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. Flesh and blood can't inherit God's kingdom Something that rots can't inherit something that doesn't decay. Listen, I'm telling you a secret. All of us won't die, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the blink of an eye at the final trumpet, the trumpet will blast, the dead will be raised with bodies that won't decay, and we will be changed. It's necessary for this rotting body to be clothed with what can't decay and for the body that is dying to be clothed in what can't die. Now, he's not talking about a spirit-only existence, is he? He's talking about a new body, a new person. The same kind of body that Adam and Eve had before they sinned. The same kind of body that Jesus had when he was resurrected. And yet it's linked to us right now in the way that a seed is linked to a tree. Or a cocoon is linked to a butterfly. We're in essence the same person. 
but it's a different form. And this is where people get skeptical and they say, well, I, I don't get that. Does That just doesn't make any sense to me. I thought I had this whole thing figured out. I, Don, I kind of prefer the clouds and the stars and the puppy dogs, you know. I understand that. I really do. It's, it's, at first, we think, well, that's easier to get, you know. I get rid of this body, and I'm some kind of spiritual form for the rest of my life. But stop and really think about this. I mean, have you ever... Stop and really think about just a soul existence for the rest of your life. You're going to hear things without ears, this soul ears. You're going to see things without eyes, this soul existence. You're going to speak without vocal cords in this soul existence that we've believed that myth. Resurrection body is just maybe too much to understand, but you understand and accept a soul kind of existence for the rest of your life? See, that's, that's not easy either, is it? You know, it's um, generally accepted now by scientists that we are composed of atoms that are 13 billion years old. We're mostly hydrogen, 60%, H2O, kind of puffy today, right? Right? 60% hydrogen. And we're 40% stardust. Those atoms come from, as scientists say, the Big Bang when everything exploded. I'm not going to go into Genesis and try to explain that, but atoms come from the stars, stardust. And our atoms that make up our bodies are, well, they're pretty old. Even you youngins, they're pretty old. You know, um, they get recycled. God's real green. He recycles these atoms over and over and over and over. There's probably a little bit of Tyrannosaurus Rex in you, whether you, you know, I think there's a little bit of Abe Lincoln in me, don't you think, as wise as I am? You know, no. These atoms just, you know, you don't keep them. Every seven years, you're a all your atoms are, are changed every seven years. They're constantly changing. You know, a little bit of stardust here and stardust there. And, and you might think that you're the same person that you were when you were a little child, but you're not. Your atoms have changed a lot atomically. You're a different person. Does that mess you up? See, we thought things, we thought, well, this body is the same. It, it never changes. No, it's constantly changing. You're giving and taking stuff from people and things. And, oh, wow, you know. That's a ladder with no top on it, right? You could just think about that all day. You never get to the end of that one. Atoms of change. We, we all get mixed up in, and in the past and the future. And that doesn't make uh, the resurrection any more scientifically understandable except to say that God does not need to reassemble our atoms from where they've scattered because there is no such thing as our atoms. They're all God's atoms, from dust to dust, he says. And we are mostly composed of dust and water, is what we are. And it's changing all the time. And we, we get to the point where we quickly must say that, you know, well, that's, that's just a God problem. He's just going to have to figure that out, isn't he? Because we, we can't get our mind around that any more than what we can get our mind around soul existence. One that has to be handled by the one who will make all things new. In a moment, it says, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 John 3, 2 speaks to that. To jump out of Paul just a little bit. He says, dear friends, now we are God's children and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. We, we don't know exactly what we're going to be. That comes from John. And we think we can figure it out? Probably not. Sometimes you just have to take what somebody else says, speaking from God, and just say, okay, I, I think that's the way it is. Okay, so, so what? I mean, what's this going to help you with this week, right? What's, what's the whole application of Don going on about this for uh, Sunday morning, you know? You know, at the close of this teaching, this chapter, the last verse, Paul gives us the reason as to why this is important. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 
He says, as a result of all of this, all this chapter about resurrection, my loved brothers and sisters, you must stand firm, unshakable, excelling in the work of the Lord as always, because you know that your labor isn't going to be for nothing in the Lord. Now, you very seldom see that verse associated with resurrection. We use that verse to encourage missionaries and pastors. People a little bit down. You say, hang in there, man. Keep going. It's going to be all right. Be true to the Lord. You know, your work's not in vain. Paul says that the resurrection of believers and the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we're not doing anything for God in vain right now. After, after teaching about resurrection, he says, stand firm, be unshakable. Do God's work because you know that your labor isn't for nothing. Seldom is this passage used in, in resurrection. He wants us to know that what we do here today in his kingdom is linked to the future world, that there's continuity. What we do in our lives for him in his kingdom is somehow linked to this redemption of all things, when he makes the world new and evil is put away and we have new bodies. Now, now how is that? I don't know. But th this, this theme runs through Scripture that what we're doing today is not just washed out at death, but there's a continuity between our actions today and the kingdom that is going to come. And we are working today from the kingdom and it doesn't just stop when Jesus returns and the kingdom arrives, but there's a connection here. Physical death isn't the end. We're building something today that's not going to end. To, to throw ourselves into the work of the Lord means that we ha constantly have to die to ourselves. Earlier on, Paul said in, in verse 31, he says, I die every day. Right? Paul says, I die every day. So when we die to ourselves... We give God a chance to be born in us. This is the Christ-like circle of life. And kind of like exchanging the atoms. Okay? We give something up and something new comes in. Whenever we die for Christ, that always follows the life of Christ. This inner power that we did not have before. So I think what Paul's telling us is that if we really believe in the resurrection, we're going to live forward where we're going we're gonna to seed our life forward. And we're not living to get God's approval. We've got God's approval. We're living for this new kingdom. Okay, It's a huge concept, one that we don't hear very much. But Paul teaches all of this to get to that verse, that verse 58. You know, we can change from hopelessness to hope in just a split second, in a twinkling of an eye, not at the coming of Jesus Christ, but right now, that's all it takes is for us just to believe in a split second that, okay, it's possible. No, I think it's, I think it's real. I think Jesus really did die, and he came back in a, in a real body. I think, I think that's so. And I'm going to build in God's kingdom. Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is here in heaven. Okay, that's the end of the story. We can change from hopelessness to hope in a second. So here's a couple questions for you. I always like to leave you something to rattle around, you know. Instead of me saying you, let me ask we. Are we living like Jesus is alive? I mean, really, are we living like Jesus is alive? Are we living like Okay, I believe the story, I believe everything was said, but I don't really live like Jesus is alive. I find myself in that a lot. And the second question would be, are you working in the kingdom of God as if what you do today is linked to the future? There's a couple questions to ask yourself. You know, I, I hope my PG-13 sermon wasn't too much for you. I, I don't think I stumbled anybody trying to get us back to the truth and away from stories that we really know aren't true. We, we know down deep that all that stuff isn't true. Um, I, I just think that maybe we haven't heard anything any better than that.
thirsty Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out